Hey, Joe. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Josh. How are you doing? Good, good. I appreciate you being on. Yeah, I can't wait to dig in. Yeah, I saw you guys. Uh, you finally had Garof on your show. Congratulations for landing him. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Stanislav Groff. Poof. Yeah, like <laughs> legendary interview for us. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him a few times, but this was the first time having him on the show. And it was, um, yeah, definitely a big, really big experience for me and for Kyle. And Brigitte as well with him. Which, uh, that was my first time actually chatting with her, and she's wonderful. I, um, yeah, just couldn't be happier for Stan being in such good hands. Yeah, it was a it was a great interview. Um, Thank you. And she did a good job uh, at like stepping in for him and speaking for him when he was kind of stumbling over what he was trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for those who don't know, um, Dr. Stan Groff had a stroke a few years ago, so he's um, he's recovering well, um, but his his language capacity it's like his fourth language, English probably. So you know he's doing pretty well considering. Yeah, considering for sure. And I understand he had a huge influence on you and Kyle and specifically um, on your path. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about uh, how he influenced you into where you are now? Mm. So, yeah, he. I ran into Stan, Stan's work in 2001, um, doing an undergrad in the middle of New Hampshire State School up there uh, in philosophy. And I just bump into a reference to Stan doing uh, LSD psychotherapy on somebody um, in this book, uh, si assigned reading that goes to freshmen. I'm like, okay, cool. This, this seems pretty fun. Um, but this story just was mind bending and pretty much was saying that, um, you know, uh, superstitious type things, it's not even the right word for it, ESP, et cetera, was real. It's kind of like validating his experience of it being real in this book they were giving to undergrads and it was really uh shocking and i, I was like i i pay these people to teach me not necessarily to lie to me so like what's going on here so i decided to like dig in and thankfully we had three or four books by stan groff at the school library so i was able to start just digging in in 2001 um you know with zero training in psychology or anything like that i'm just like uh fascinated and very interested and a philosophy student so it was a perfect match so he was saying things like LSD can cure all of these disorders, if not just take the edge off of them substantially. Why a radical, diff radically different view on what medicine is, uh, which is really fascinating. Um, he proposes like a radical revision of medicine, psychiatry, and many other things, ways of being through, you know, methods like holotropic breathwork, which was what I got into in 2003 quite heavily with my teachers at Dream Shadow in Vermont. And um, yeah, I did maybe six years of holotropic breath work with them before I even kind of jumped deeply into the psychedelic arena um, directly. Even though I'm reading Groff and talking with all these people with a lot of psychedelic experiences, I took my time um, digging in and, and engaging directly with the, the materials. So um, yeah, that was really great um, and a really great prep. So Stan allowing us to understand that these experiences like enlightenment experiences or, you know, talking to entities are kind of natural and they kind of happen all over the place and you're not necessarily schizophrenic or need to be locked up. Like perhaps there's something helpful there. Like you had Michelle on Michelle Hobart on, uh, for episode one, maybe. Yeah. And she, you know, she's pretty, pretty aware of the Groff material. Um, pretty literate on that stuff. And that's kind of how she works a little bit too. It's like, we can have these experiences doesn't mean we ha have to like define how they happened for them to be valid experiences. You still had the experience and that's probably the biggest part in that we all contain this massive amount of healing intelligence in our bodies. Our, bo our mind body is an integrated whole and it knows how to heal us. If we give it the right environment, tools, energy, whatever it is, um, the body can heal uh, a lot of things on its own. And it's uh, it's extraordinary. Like we're seeing all this stuff about allergy remission and, um, you know, really wild nervous system uh, resolutions. Interesting. As allergy kind of remission. side effects. Wow, that, um, I've never heard of allergy remission before. From Doctor Andy Wheel made that quite popular. He's um he's the guy that made turmeric very popular. I think he also was responsible for Tim Leary getting kicked out of Harvard with Ramdas. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> but he he actually popularized this story about his cat allergy going away after uh, either LSD or psilocybin mushrooms. Um, really interesting. And now there's a lot of testimony around this and a lot of people actually looking at it. I think there's now even pharma groups looking at it. It should be really interesting if a lot of allergies go away. That would be really nice for a lot of people. Really helpful. It's incredible how the mind can have such faculty over like physics. Um, I think Paul Stamets, uh, he claimed to have gotten over a really, really serious stutter um, after using psilocybin mushrooms, right? That's quite the story, right? Uh, I, <laughs> you've heard him tell that, right? Where he's like um, high up on a tree climbing while very high on mushrooms. And um, yeah, like more, I think greater than five grams if I'm not mistaken, but I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, he was able to talk to the pretty girl that was his crush at high school like the next day. Uh, he thankfully survived the lightning storm. Yeah, the lightning storm, right? That was the most insane part of that story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, one of uh, one of Groff's most, in my view, most influential contributions to the psyche is uh, the perinatal birth matrices. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about each stage of that and what those are? Totally, yeah, so... Um, the birth perinatal matrices are one of his major contributions. He was also kind of the founder of transpersonal psych, co-founder of transpersonal psychology. Talked a lot about the expansion of the cartography of the psyche, and yeah, birth perinatal matrices being another one of his major contributions to psychology. And yeah, this there was an idea um, in medicine psychology for a long time that because of the state of neurons at the time of birth and for the first period of time as you're alive after birth. Um, well, it's a weird phrasing. Because when I think when I think of the birth perinatal matrices, they get a little, they get a little wonky sometimes, um, especially when you're transitioning from this uh, aquatic mammal that doesn't need to eat or breathe to you die to that, but you're still the same organism. That no longer happens. Now you're an air-breathing semi-aquatic mammal that needs to eat um, and use its GI system in a normal fashion, right? It's really interesting. So, um, well, I just brought a lot of visions to mind, Josh, so hold, hold on <laughs> with me, I'm getting really interesting uh, thoughts. But um, yeah, so it's broken up into four parts. So one is kind of like the gestational period. Two is kind of this like no exit scenario with the closed cervix and the walls coming in no exit, kind of like John Paul Sartre. And then um, the cervix is opening a little bit, so there's like a light at the end of the tunnel. Think like Star Wars when Luke's trying to like do this whole thing through the Death Star to throw that bomb down. Weirdly sexual allegories there, but you know, it's, um, <laughs> you know, there, the, a light at the end of the tunnel and you're trying, there's a little bit of hope, like a new hope comes like after all the walls are coming in. Now there's a little bit of hope. And then um, kind of like a lot of, fighting and battle there and then um at the end yeah four you're totally a new a very different entity you're a very different biological entity at that point and what it's fascinating you know now you're no one's feeding you through an umbilical cord all the time like you know um you're finally autonomous and then you know there's a little bit of an issue there with uh cesarean borns so there's a little bit of a a, a difference in this. And so Stan realized that a lot of people were doing surgery on babies without anesthesia and that this was kind of um, rough, like and not really great because we are having an impact on that person's body and therefore their psyche as a result of doing this stuff to these people. The idea was the nerves weren't myelinated and therefore couldn't store memories. And later this was proven in, in uh, animal models that unmyelinated and think of it like a like a conductor like a nerve conductor maybe allows kind of signaling um i think it was worms they they found this in worms without myelinated neurons were able to store memories and they're like oh we actually have a non-human example of this working so um then the next thought is what kind of imprints are on the child from gestation through birth so that's why it's called perinatal, like around birth. Um, and yeah, the B 
BPM one, kind of this oceanic or like hellscape um, situation where either you're totally nurtured, taken care of, everything's beautiful. Sometimes things get bad because, you know, sometimes people are, you know, using kind of somewhat harmful drugs or toxic situations arise in the body, like autoimmune reactions to children happen quite a bit, um, kind of tragic when that happens. And then um, each of these phases kind of have positive and negative poles, kind of. Um, yeah, so on one hand, oceanic, loving, beautiful. On the other hand, hellscape, where you're getting attacked for nine months by who knows what. Could be autoimmune, drugs, whatever. And on the second, BPM, BPM2, birth perinatal matrix 2, no exit. Sometimes um, there's a little bit of strength there and a, a, like a good bit of will and, and pushing back. And I'm probably butchering this because I haven't read Groff in a couple of years. But um, yeah, there... Or there's just like, it's hopeless. Like think Franz Kafka or like a, you know, concentration camp situation where there's absolutely no hope. Like there's, you, you're stuck and you're going to die. And, you know, it can feel like that. Sometimes your blood can get removed from the body in really weird ways. Um, so what else here? Uh, three, A New Hope. <laughs> um <laughs> Star Wars people. Um, so for those who don't know, Star, um, Joseph Campbell, famous mythologist, huge friends with Stan Groff, was also hugely influential in um, the writing of Star Wars um, with George Lucas and um, really helped secure Star Wars kind of like a uh, nearly eternal franchise. We'll see how long it lasts for, but it seems to be going nowhere anytime soon. Um, so... Yeah, there's a little bit of hope. Sometimes it's totally futile and you can't win. Sometimes the odds are too great against you. Maybe umbilical cords around your neck and you can't really, you're like, you know, passing out and like really getting stressed out. Um, other times it's like a clean fight. You know, in my instance, I had a 18 hour horrifying labor ending in an emergency C-section. So like I tried for a long time, but I failed and had to get pulled out. Um, interest note the phrasing there i failed <laughs> so um but you know anesthesia comes in and just goes <laughs> like you know the curtain comes down all of a sudden i'm awake and alive um and uh yeah detached from my mother do you feel something is lost sort of when you have it when when you are um a baby of c-section there's a different kind of psychology um that probably develops there's been some books written on this there's been um there's actually a whole movement around this now I, I just found out about recently but there's very little research happening at the university level i think around birth psychology like perinatal psychology we, we'll call it maybe for convenience sake um but yeah absolutely there's a book called a different doorway um stacia butterfield i think is the author of that um I should probably have these books in front of me because I always try to find them and it's always hard. But it it talks a lot about how the experience of um, cesarean born is quite different um, from uh, natural birth. So I can't really go into those differences offhand. Um, but you know, there's there's definitely like definitely a difference. And Graf uh, at a number of times has said that cesarean births are probably one of the largest i don't know if groff said this but it's one of the largest uncontrolled psychological experiments on the planet uh, because some countries it's like greater than 50 percent of children being born are c-section now yeah and it seems to be increasing right i think domestically it's decreasing okay um and um but in other countries i think brazil's got a really high rate in mexico as well um yeah there's there's a lot there um, and I wish I could lay it out for you, but it's it's definitely a really interesting um, conversation. It's deep. It goes very deep. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. these are the first, this is your first time as a human organism uh, encountering tremendously huge forces. Like you've never really experienced anything. All of a sudden you're having these it's kind of your first experience of archetypes. These are the first things get that get laid down on your psyche and your body. 
and they kind of lay the groundwork for your experience of the world downstream. So when Groff came up with this, was it through observing it um, clinically in like transpersonal sessions? So um, Stan is part of a lineage depth psychology. So there were people talking about this a little bit in Europe in the depth psychology circles, like Otto Rank was a really big one. Um, I don't remember who else in the European scene was up to this, but there were others, I think. But um, so that was that was in the air. Stan was working in Soviet Prague at the time, so didn't necessarily have the same access as kind of like we'll call it free world scientists and doctors did. Um, but you know, he did get a whole bunch of LSD to work with, and eventually had his own hospital um, or I don't know building at a hospital site or something to do a lot of this psychedelic work. But um, I've been told what. Um, what was available in Soviet Prague was different from uh, what was available in the U.S. and other places because everything was quite centralized. The Soviets really liked detailed records, so there was a lot of detailed records of births, and um, he was able to go corroborate people's stories about reliving their births by checking records. They were just available locally. You know, like people weren't as mobile as they are today. Like if you grew up in Prague, you probably stayed in Prague as opposed to today in the U.S. where you barely stay where you're born. Um, So um, he just had special access. Uh, But he was observing some really weird things. And some really strange phenomena would uh, intermittently come up in sessions where people would be, like, choking. And then they they would have this strange experience related to an umbilical cord around the neck or something strange happening at birth. And um, then if you really amplify those then there could be some things that resolve as a result of that, as opposed to, oh, you're choking, let's calm you down and make sure you, you know, are okay and don't have a bad experience here. But like part of this whole process is that there does, in order to have these very large um, movements in in your psyche, you um, sometimes have to suffer a lot in the session and work through some pretty powerful things. Yeah. sounds like, you know what I'm saying? Um, oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> as opposed to let me, let me just eat that Xanax. So it's perfect again. And I don't, I'm not stressed out. Um, which I think is a bad idea. I think killing typically. a trip or killing an experience before it has its, it's time to work itself out, I think is never really a good idea. Unless obviously there's some sort of like physical, I did it once at a music know. festival, but only once out of my kind of long career here. Um, How did that work out for you? It was fine. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, I've actually never even talked about this on our podcast, but it was somewhere around eight to 20 hits in a, by accident, certainly wow. well, not that on situation. purpose. Yeah. And I'm like, um, I'm not trying to do inner work here. I'm at a music festival. Like I would rather be with my friends and have fun seeing these bands that I really want to see. And, um, so, you know, I was still up to like six, seven in the morning cause you know, LSD is strong. Um, despite the the benzodiazepines but yeah you know Groff talks a lot about how the psychic process gets really amplified and you don't want to interrupt it because it can cause some kind of um energy flow interruptions or i don't i don't know the right way to put it things can get stuck and solidified and you might have to do a lot of work to get through that again in the future um so in the past a lot of people would get injected with things like thorazine and pretty powerful sedatives um until they were sober. Um, and I'm told in emergency rooms, they're not doing that as much. They're actually knowing to actually just sit with people a little bit more. Or, You're fine. <laughs> this drug isn't that bad for you. It'll be over. It might take a while, but you know, you'll get through this. So, um, I'm sure they're giving kind of low doses of things as opposed to like massive doses. It's obviously safer to give less drugs in a medical environment than more. Right. So, yeah, but, you know, people can go in a bad direction. You know, look at, compare LSD aficionados like um, Ram Dass and Tim Leary, compare it to others like, um, you know, Charles Manson, for instance. Like something happened there on on the bad side and something happened on the other side that was really good, in my opinion. You know, Ram Dass is kind of hard to argue. It's, you know, a bad case, exa- an example case, right? I'd say, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Tim Leary, a little more medium, but I'm still, I still idolize the hell out of Tim Leary. Yeah. He's often disrespected in my opinion and, uh, not valued for what he brought to the, um, to the, not the resurgence, but the, uh, the initial movement, you know, the first, the first movements of the psychedelics. Um, but what mm-hmm. do you feel like the, the differences between, uh, like a Ram Dass and Tim Leary, as opposed to Charles Manson, like what happened? Was it, do you think it's, it's a, it's integration? Uh, Manson's a really tough case. Um, yeah. Cause it, there, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes along with him politically. <laughs> I would love to talk about that too, but like the book chaos does a really good job discussing what happened with Manson. Um, and it looks like he was actually willfully given the tools and skill sets to do what he did in order to discredit the, um, psychedelic and hippie movements. Um, anytime you see a hippie, Charles Manson's lurking behind those, that long hair and crazy eyes, you know, that's the so, Tom O'Neill book, right? I think, I think that's his name. Yeah. Ex- <laughs> incredible book. Um, you pair that with uh, this book, I think it's called Strange Tales from the Canyon or Weird, Weird Tales from the Canyon about Laurel Canyon. And they, they pair really nicely because it shows how much like was happening. And this is all Vietnam War, highly political time, strong, well-funded Cold War apparatus was going in the US and uh, a lot of anti-Soviet paranoia and all sorts of nut, nutso stuff. So it's not a clean story. Um, but yeah, like, integration maybe so say we just find someone that had a bad time and went down a bad direction started getting some really strange ideas you know let's um yeah make a new weird religion actually okay i'm i'm actually now imagining somebody i know um and that might be a good example so all of a sudden you start having some religious experiences not necessarily realizing that that religious experience has been quite democratized now everybody can have their own and yours might not necessarily line up with what theirs said. So now you can easily be in a personal holy war one-on-one. Um, you know, there's these personal Gnostic experiences versus like more universal ones. Um, and, you know, that can set somebody up on like a missionary fervor as opposed to like, let's look inside and what's going on in me. And let's like, you know, what are some inarguable facts about reality versus like, you know, this weird experience gave me these strange ideas and now I'm hurting people um, as a result. And maybe I don't even think of it like I'm hurting people. Maybe, uh, oh, I'm saving you um, kind of deal or like um, this is good for you. So I'm going to do this even though by popular American opinion, it might not look like consent was there or anything like that was there. Um, yeah, it's a, t- it's a tough jam um, to negotiate and people are just so convinced they kind of have brainwashed themselves sometimes. Yeah. Do you yeah. see this being an ongoing issue with this new renaissance of psychedelia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Like there's a, a lot of really crazy stuff going on in the space. I'm sure you've noticed some of it at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, faction wars, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Like, you know, uh, wildly radical left versus people just trying to like start a small pharma company to cure disorders that haven't been touched in 30 well ever um you know like this small group of 10 people trying to make you know this disorder go away but they're the enemy because there's money involved it's like well the feds aren't giving us any money for this research so it has to come from money people unless we don't think there needs to be research which is which is a really weird stance in my opinion. I think there needs to be a lot more research done because there's more psychedelic use going on now than there was in the 60s. And as a result, we should have some science to match and help inform the public and healthcare workers on what's what's appropriate and what the best routes are here. Yeah, there are definitely lessons to be learned from the 60s and 70s. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff going on with, uh, with abuse as well um, mm-hmm. that I've noticed is is coming to the forefront. And you see it happening more and more, which is really concerning. Um, what do you think? It might not be do? more and more. It might just be that we're finally hearing about it. But yeah. go ahead. Sorry, what was your question? Uh, no, I, I, honestly, I do think you're right. Um, and that kind of goes along with like this whole social media culture in general is that you're seeing more and more of things. It's not necessarily that it's happening at an increased frequency. 
Um, but mm -hmm. what can be done about that? Because I, that's something that I can see really halting uh, the Renaissance, so to speak. Um, on a positive, they can't make it any more illegal. It'd be really hard in America to make this stuff any more illegal than it is currently. So the resurgence might not go anywhere, uh, which I'm hopeful for. Um, but what can be done? I so we were involved in a number of abuse situations trying to get information out and um you know our approach was to share as much information privately as possible so we don't get a lawsuit on our hands um defamation or otherwise um and you know sometimes post really vanilla blog posts saying things like hey there's some un safety issues here like we don't endorse these people anymore um and that that definitely happened in the past for us um and I think, you know, decriminalization is a step in the right direction and it can help make people be a little bit more open about this because right now we're dealing with like, you're a narc and you will be a social pariah in these communities and never be allowed to access these services again if you go to the police to try to report somebody um, if they're doing illegal stuff. In legal spaces, like MAPS had that Jensen situation um, in, in Vancouver, I think, and that was really rough. Um, and that was a, a legal, I think, session um, through the MAPS protocol. And, um, you know, in other circles, the San Francisco thing that you're talking about, I believe, you know, what could have been done and how could that... People were afraid, you know, people were intimidated. Um, they're, you're dealing with a religion, in a sense. You're dealing with, you know, people's community. Uh, you're dealing with, like, how do I get my sacrament if I leave and out these people? Um, just, like... Black markets inherently are kind of like weirdly centralized. And um, how do we decentralize that and give people less power? Dark web markets, dark markets, by the way, is one of the answers here. Um, you know, because the feds aren't taking care of us, the state's not taking care of us, so we have to take care of ourselves and do harm reduction. And if that's our sacrament, we need to get our sacrament, and that's one of the ways to do it. You know, I'm, I told some people to go to a fish concert to like get some like recently and that didn't really wasn't well taken but i'm like it's there it's all over <laughs> so like, yeah. what are, you know you're making fun of me for telling you that i'm just telling you where it is you know if you can't figure out the internet you have to figure out geography or make connections and friends or whatever it is so you know if, um i'm really excited about things like genetically engineered um production of some of these compounds so um engineering bacteria to excrete things like mdma uh, mescaline, et cetera, could be really helpful. Um, there's also new cell culture situations where we can take cells uh, from living plants and animals and actually culture them out to get the types of compounds we want. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Um, there's actually some really interesting crypto NFT type projects that are trying to build in this kind of safety. I know there's people in the Bay actively working on this, so stay tuned. I think there's there's all sorts of um, interesting ways we could look at that and figure out how to build in safety for folks. Um, and then, you know, go to, so if you've seen something, try to go to a bunch of leaders in the space, especially if they're um, not affiliated with the abuser. Um, I've, I've found a lot of affiliations go deeper than um, people's willingness to work on these situations i've been shut down by some really unfortunate um individuals in the past who are quite prominent and it, it's been heartbreaking to see that and it's because of their affiliations institutional engagements all that kind of stuff so you know start quietly telling people about it i don't think the right move is to just all alone start writing a blog because you can get sued really hard that way um, and sometimes legal action can be taken against you and i've seen that recently too um, so, huh. and find a small tribe that you can be safe with. If you're doing this as a solo sport, you're, you're a much easier prey. Like in nature, fish have this whole, whole defense mechanism where they're kind of like hard to pick just one because it's such a weird movement. If you're a shark, you, you kind of miss that cloud of fish. I don't even know what that's called. School of fish mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a tactic it's kind of like community as harm reduction and community as medicine um 
because if you're just going to an expert, you're you're not disempowered. And I would say like education is a big one there too. That's why we focus so much on education here. Like if we're able to give the people power, you know, the elite have less power and therefore can hopefully take care of themselves. I know uh, Ralph Metzner, also of Harvard fame, paired with Tim and Ram Dass for a while. Um, he was all about these egalitarian circles. So figure out the skills together, figure out how to do it yourself, and then you don't necessarily need to go to these big institutions. Yeah, I mean, speaking yeah. of you know creating communities and um, spreading harm reduction and spreading knowledge, you guys do a fantastic job of that. Um, Thank you. So I understand that you started out as just the podcast, and then you expanded later into the field of, of education. Um, what mm -hmm. made you guys want to go outside of the podcast and sort of broaden your scope? Yeah. Um, we started the podcast because Stan Groff wasn't getting enough play. And then we were like, okay, cool. Like people like this. And then all of a sudden we're racking up bills and I wasn't able to really afford it on my own anymore. So let's sell some classes. And we were able to develop the, the programs that we wish we had in high school and college to, uh, you know, minimize our, sketchy situations maybe it's a good way to put it dicey situations that popped up or existential angst that popped up so there's um that's largely it that's why we started and it was a way to fund the show and it was a way to um you know we certainly weren't making money for a long time there but uh it was making an impact and helping people be safer with compounds giving them a better theoretical understanding of what was going on or is that the right way to put it? A more nuanced um, approach to understanding science and theory, maybe. Yeah, because nobody really understood transpersonal or somatic. At that point in time, it's just like you eat drugs, right? You're eating drugs and things happen. Um, so that was the intent there. All of a sudden, doctors and therapists started showing up and we had to start serving them <laughs> separately because we're, we're saying this, this class isn't really for you. Um, so I think we need to develop something custom for you. And and we did. And that was uh, Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists, which um, we let other people in. We just make sure people understand it's, um, we're going to be talking at a relatively high level on these topics. Yeah, we're not going to dummy it down just because you're not a doctor. We're going to like talk to you like you're quite skilled and understand a lot of this stuff. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. And you said, so when people hear um, the word therapist, clinician, you, coaching, like these things all sort of merge together within uh, the education of psychedelics. So can you kind of go into what the difference is between a therapist, a clinician, and a coach? Mm-hmm. Um. So coach is totally outside the realm of medicine for the most part. They're not able to prescribe. They're not able to bill insurance for their services. Um, it, a coach is kind of an amorphous thing. It's an unlicensed um, title for the most part. Some, some people get certificates, but it's not a license in the same way a licensed practice medicine or prescribe is, right? Um, or to run x-rays or whatever it is. So it's um, outside the purview of the state for the most part in terms of like the licensing boards and all that. Um, and you can do a lot there. There's a lot of therapists that are actually letting their licenses go because they feel too constrained by the license, the license therapy framework. And they would prefer to do it more like a coach. So a coach can, can tell you what to do. A therapist is, is probably not allowed to say, don't do that. Um, or why don't you do these 20 to 80 things to improve your life? It's a different kind of relationship. Um, so therapists want to help you work it out in a lot of ways. But therapies, therapy itself is a really broad thing. There's so many different frameworks. So there's like really behaviorist Pavlovian kind of methods like CBT, DBT, di dialectic behavioral therapy, I think, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And then there's things like somatic experiencing that look quite alien <laughs> to, to the normal person. They're, you know, what's going on in the body, making you aware of your body, getting into your body, being embodied generally. That's very different from like, you know, when I feel stressed, I'm going to run the, 
run the tape and do these 20 things to get out of this frame, right? Um, very different. So therapy as a licensed profession is very vast. There's so many different methodologies. And um, inside that scope are all sorts of funny neurological tools like um, brain spotting, EMDR, and, and all these uh, kind of non-traditional methods that are, are quite curious. Um, yeah. And then clinicians. Clinicians are people that are providing clinical services like therapy, like surgery, like, um, you know, bladder tests and just running through all sorts of fun things here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like x-rays, MRIs, um, yeah, like, uh, stress tests, you know, blood tests, things like that. Things that look more medical and fit into this medical framework, psychiatric medication, for instance. Yeah. Like anything where a nurse or doctor might be there, that could be clinical therapists kind of count as clinical because you're treating clinical indications like depression or, you know, things that kind of you hit all these check marks and you qualify as having this thing. It's kind of an abstraction. It's not necessarily a real thing. It's just the the tests confirm you're good. So you fit in this little bucket and then you're you're allowed to get these certain kinds of treatments. As opposed to the coach might the coach might take it more holistically, but there are there are clinical services that are operating quite holistically now too, so it's not like it's mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Your flagship program is navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists, but now you guys have Vital, so that is a way more intensive certificate program, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um. Navigating psychedelics is somewhere around 47 hours and, and vital is something more around 150 plus. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more than that, but but we'll see. Yeah, and it's a 12-month program. We're actually engaging in this material for a long time with world-class experts. Um, you know, uh, the names we've been able to get attached to the program are unbelievable and I'm endlessly excited about it. So, um it's re really, really fabulous. The idea is, you know, we can't offer a license to people. We're not, you know, sanctioned by the state to say, yep, these people are good to go and can facilitate sessions because a lot of these things are quite illegal. You know, ketamine, cannabis, salvia divinorum, they can be found legally in the United States. You can get a ketamine prescription. In fact, I'm going to start, uh, I'll show you legal ketamine in a prescription bottle right now. I'm going to actually go do ketamine assisted psychotherapy next week. Oh legally. wow, that's great. Yeah. And get get this, you don't actually even need a therapist. You can do it with a coach or a nurse or a friend or alone if your clinician tells you that's okay. Um and that's legal. And this program would really help somebody be ready for doing that kind of work, helping people prep for sessions or um yeah all sorts of really, really valuable things there. So, and we're also going to allow both clinicians and non-clinicians into the program, and we're going to give them experiences. So we're going to figure out angles in Jamaica and Netherlands and offer sessions in those countries with mushrooms. We're, we're, uh, Netherlands is a psilocybin containing fungus. It's a, it's more of a truffle in Jamaica. You can do actual mushrooms. Um, so it's really exciting to see how this is going to shake out. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I didn't know you guys were actually mm -hmm. going to facilitate experiences. That's that's great. And we're going to contract with some people so we're less legally at risk. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's going to be really fun. Um, I think, yeah, I'm endlessly excited about it. We push about 100 people through the program. And there are going to be people where it's medically not okay to have sessions, right? Like various heart conditions or psych psychic issues. Um, plenty of other things could come up. So we're going to look at holotropic breath work, maybe Vipassana meditation, maybe some Jungian, Reikian techniques um, to really just get people engaged in the process and, and know what it's like to be in a really big, um, comp complicated inner state. Yeah, breath work is, is something that's really interesting to me because I've never actually done any sort of breath work at all. Mm. Um, so when I hear about people having breathwork experiences that are on par with the power of like a psilocybin experience, it seems almost unbelievable to me. Do you see that happen a lot with people? 
I can't say a lot, but it does happen. So my biggest experience on psychedelics wasn't that LSD accident. It was ayahuasca. Um, and um, my biggest holotropic breathwork experience was probably bigger and more intense than that. Wow. At least rattled me hard. And that was kind of like my turning point. That was like the thing that kind of um, set me through my, my worst dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of catalyzed me through that. So what about um, that experience was so difficult? Was it the the fear that came up during the experience? Was it sometime after? Like what? Anguish. Anguish and despair, mm. I think. Yeah. As big as possible. So the feelings were very big. Um, and that, that happens, right? Like this, the Groff model is often about making the experience really big, making that pain really big so that it resolves the full experience of the emotion is its funeral pyre is a popular catchphrase we like to use. So like, you know, feeling anxiety at max might really, you know, relieve that in your day to day um, in a session in a good container. Yeah. So yeah. do you, do you facilitate currently? Do you facilitate any breath work? We had to stop for COVID. Okay. Um, I do. Um, but yeah, we we haven't done it in, in a long time. Um, I'm hoping this year we can bring it back. I have some plans. Um, we're in negotiations with some pretty famous institutions to facilitate with them. And um, as part of Vital, we'll probably be facilitating some stuff. We, we've got to figure out what our protocols are that we feel safe with, and then we can go forward from there. Because if we don't feel safe, people might catch up on that, catch, uh, catch that feeling, and could get really amplified um, in their session. Mm-hmm. Is it advisable to do breath work by yourself? Uh, yes and no. My my stock answer is check out Wim Hof uh, mm -hmm. breath work, um, uh, or check out some yoga practices with you know books and maybe get a little bit of guidance. But you can do it at home alone probably. But you know a really easy one is the alternate nostril breathing. So breathe in, then breathe out on the other one, breathe, and then back and forth, breathe in, then out. Really calms you down, down regulates a lot. And that's a really popular and quite ancient yoga breathing method. But there's plenty of others. Um, but the Wim Hof stuff, people have died doing it, but it's largely that they're, you know, blacking out and hitting their head in the shower when they're all alone or like doing the ice submersion things that Wim Hof likes to do. Um, so. As long as you follow the parameters to the T, you're going to be safe with Wim Hof. Um, but, you know, take some cautions. And people can have some really big experiences there. But holotropic breath work, I don't really advise because the, the experience can get really big for people. And um, sometimes people could have a manic thing uh, and, you know, run out into the street and, you know, want to tell the police the good news or get on the radio station to share, you know, the revelations. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of blown out like how, how much that could happen. Like it's not really likely that it would happen, but it, it can. I've seen people run away um, from psychedelic sessions. I've seen people try to leave breathwork sessions, but we're usually pretty good at keeping them there. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you drive, you know, four to eight hours to have a breathwork workshop and then all of a sudden you, you try to leave like 20 minutes into breathing you're like hmm you did agree that you were going to stay till the end of the workshop but you you want to leave 20 minutes in like what's that about obviously there's some running going on yeah if you've been in the space long enough you've seen people try to run away from experiences for sure like literally yeah yeah literally yeah i've seen a person bounce up run out of the house and drive away and i was like oh that's not a good situation but Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, I have to run in like four minutes here mm -hmm. uh, for I'm teaching navigating psychedelics uh, in a minute here. Oh, fantastic. really exciting. But just wanted to make sure you knew that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want to get out there? Um, well, people check out Vital, vitalpsychedelictraining.com. You can find it at psychedelicstoday.com. Uh, um, podcast is everywhere podcasts are found except i noticed you're on amazon i don't know how to do that i'll, I'll probably need to figure that out 
Um, yeah, it was part of a, I, I use Red Circle as my distributor okay. and it was just, it was part of their, uh, their platform. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. Not too hard then. Cool. And, um, yeah, what else? We've got some books, all sorts of merch, a trip journal and an integration workbook. They've been out for years selling quite well. People love them. Um, I'm, I'm blown away. We're kind of seasoned veterans. will grab our books and work through them for their experiences and I'll, come at, back to us with amazing news about their results. Like it was the best, most productive experience I've ever had because I'd had a structured program to work through. And, you know, they also had all of our kind of support from the class and all that lecture and new kind of material. I find the intellectual prep, the theory, quite helpful when you get into the practical. Sometimes you have to check it at the door, but you're like, okay, yeah, I know I'm not going to die because this is LSD and it's going to suck for a little bit. But I'm be a lot better on the end, on the other side here. I totally agree. I think education is the most important part of this. It's more important than anything. And whenever anybody asks me where to go, I direct them towards psychedelics today, toward you guys. You guys are fantastic. Um, I really appreciate your time, Joe. Thank you for coming on. And uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. I would love to. Yeah, just let me know. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs>